Good day, BookTube. I'm here for installment two in Poetry Thursday, and uh, for this one, I'm going to go for my most recent poetry acquisition. Maybe not somewhat dated now, I suppose. And that is the Oxford Book of 20th Century English Verse, chosen by Philip Larkin. And a quick flick through, and I've just gone for somebody I've never heard of before. And simply, oh, sorry, I'm just going to have a quick sip of my drink because my throat's a bit dry. And this comes from page 165 in this edition, uh, but it is part, well, probably 170. And it's T.E. Hume, from who was born in 1883 and died in 1917. And the poem included here is called The Embankment. And in brackets here, we have parentheses. We have the fantasia of a fallen gentleman on a cold, bitter night. Once, in finesse of fiddles, found I ecstasy, in a flash of gold heels on the hard pavement. Now see I, that warmth the very stuff of posy. O oh God, make small the old star-eaten blanket of the sty. That I may fold it round me and in comfort lie. Now we'll put this on the screen so we can see there. And I imagine while we're at it, since this is T.E. Hume as well, let's go for the poem 171 image just as a, a free bit. Old houses were scaffolding once and workmen whistling. I'm going to write that one off. I think that just tickled Larkin because it just seems amusingly dashed off. But in regards to the embankment, once in finesse of fiddles found I ecstasy in a flash of gold heels on the hard pavement. Now, the fantasia of a fallen gentleman on a cold, bitter night. I have seen depicted in things, but then also in actual cobbler type videos, for want of a better way to describe it. Um, that boots and things and those dress shoes can be tipped with metals and stuff like that. So, is a flash of gold heels on the hard pavement indicative of that? But this is a fallen gentleman. So, once in finesse of fiddles found out ecstasy. Finesse of fiddles. I mean, it's nice alliteration. FFF. With off being the flip round there. So, begin F, end F, begin F, begin F. Quite nice. Finesse of fiddles. I'm not sure if that's from... The 18, late 1800s to early 1900s finesse of fiddles. I'm not sure if that's a term for drinking. It sounds like it would be. But anyway, but in a flash of gold heels on the half pavement. Now see I, that warmth's the very stuff of posy. I have heard the word posy before. And I know it doesn't mean... Like... Round around the garden, a pocket full of poses. But I never knew it was P-O-E-S-Y, so I'll have to look into that word. But I have to deal with the idea of a fallen gentleman finding their own infinitesimalness. That's a word. From viewing the sky, where I think, oh God, make small. The old star eaten blanket of the sky, that I may fold it round me and in comfort lie. I'm not sure there. If it's a prayer to God to reduce the vastness. Or maybe that type of. I don't know, when you have an existential moment and you actually take solace in the idea that we're all just cosmic 
specs were all just matter in motion under various temperatures and pressures doing what that matter would do with that movement with that pressure with that temperature but the idea of just being able to almost reach up and grab star eaten blanket it's nice that now i think about it that's nice that they would the idea would be would be a black blanket completely black and actually the stars are holes in the blanket like it's so cold you'd wrap yourself up in night time but there are still holes in it from the stars i actually do think that's quite nice but yeah i'm not i've never heard of te hume before um in fact while i'm here it's just a bonus because it's the first time i've read it i will also here is so not only do we get the bonus poem image that good old single line that didn't really do anything but was a bit whimsically amusing i will also because it is a page is it a page and a half page and a half or less there we go I will also read the preface to this by Larkin. I have taken 20th century English verse to mean verse written in English by writers born in these islands or resident here for an appreciable time who were alive during the 20th century and during it made or added to their reputations. At first I made further qualification as such writers must also have published at least one collection of poems under their own names by the end of 1965, but ultimately I relax this ruling in a few cases. These terms of reference mean that I have not included poems by American or Commonwealth writers, nor poems requiring a glossary for their full understanding, nor have I included translations as distinct from poems based on other poems. No doubt in making up the collection I have unwittingly broken most of these self-imposed limitations at one time or another. But this is where I meant to draw the line. In textual matters, I have tried to use the latest version that the author may be supposed to have approved, but in some instances, I have accepted the text that came readiest to hand. The table of contents, at any rate, supplies my sources. Many people have helped me in my choices of poems, sometimes unconsciously, but I must record my indebtedness to Miss M. M. B. Jones for her constant encouragement and for many valuable suggestions for the book's improvement. I am grateful too to Mr. Anthony Thwaite, who unselfishly allowed me to draw on his superior knowledge of present day literature. Without the generosity of the warden and fellows of All Souls College, Oxford, in offering me a visiting fellowship for two terms in 1970 and 71, I do not think I should ever have completed my task, and similar acknowledgement must be made to the University of Hull for granting me concurrent study leave. My work in Oxford, finally, was immeasurably facilitated by the kind help of Bodley's librarian and his staff, and in particular that of Mr. I. G. Philip, keeper of printed books. In making my selection, I have striven to hold a balance between all the different considerations that press on anyone undertaking a book of this kind. At first, I thought I would let this century choose the poets while I chose the poems. But outside two or three dozen names, this did not really work. In the end, I found that my material fell into three groups. Poems representing aspects of the talents of poets, judged either by their age or by myself to be worthy of inclusion. Poems judged to me to be worthy of inclusion without reference to their authors. Sorry, I missed my page there. Sorry, it's got like onion skin paper, which is a bit annoying. And, oh, sorry. Poems judged to me to carry with them something of the century in which they were written. Needless to say, the three groups are not equal in size, nor are they mutually exclusive. Looking at what I have chosen, I see that it represents a much greater number of poets than are to be found in the volumes corresponding to this one for the 19th and 18th centuries. To some extent, this is due to the kind of book I wanted to produce. But it also prompts the conclusion that once the anthologist has to deal with the poets born after 1914, his loyalty turns perforce to poems rather than to individuals. 
The consequence of this is wide rather than deep representation, and in accepting it I have acted not so much critically or even historically, but as someone wanting to bring together poems that will give pleasure to their readers both separately and as a collection. Philip Larkin, University of Hull, 1971. And we'll end the video there. Thank you for watching.